Number eight, fishing in DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only eight Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders at Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods, They'll gain access to our private Facebook group community, be entered in weekly and monthly prize giveaways, and member-specific only content, and so much more. Again, we are only eight Patreon supporters away from this next major milestone. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we're heading back down to Jurassic Park, the, the land of the lost, as I like to call it, which is the New River. It's a place that it, it, it's it, there's like some mysticism there with this place that's right in Virginia, unlike the James, which goes through the heart of Richmond. And I feel like a lot of people, especially like the musky charters, they get a lot of city dwellers that go there because it is so close to the heart of Virginia. Then you have the new and a lot of it just seems very wild and people just don't know about it, whether it's the smallmouth fishing or the musky fishing. Uh, and I'm here with, with, a, with a local legend, uh, Tim Dixon. Tim, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Sure, man. No problem. What, what got you into fishing? Oh, man, I've been raised on the river all my life. I started fishing at an early age. Uh, my grandparents, uh, my cousins and everything are Dixon. So uh, they all lived in freeze and they lay lined on the river. They fished the river. They pole wooden boats. I was with them when I was little, brought up on the river like that. And I've always loved fishing. It's just been a part of my life. Growing up on the river, what kind of changes have you seen through the years? Uh, well, he, 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 it's, it's different now because we've got a big influx of uh, people discovering the river now. You know, back in the day, it, it just used to be us. And I mean, we fished to eat back in the day I don't know, we kept everything we caught and had big fish fries that's just how we rolled but i know now you've got a lot of stuff that implements uh the river like you know you've got advocates for catch and release you got slot limits you got a lot of stuff put in play you've got a lot of guys that like the fish and are pretty passionate about it and discovering our area and of course you've got kayaks and that was introduced uh it was the kayaks introduced man you know like in 2010 i guess uh it's just got insane up there where i'm at now like with everybody fishing and stuff and it's, it's just growed a whole lot it's growed how did you get into kayak fishing uh I always uh, fished uh, a John boat and stuff. And uh, actually, this, the business I'm in, so we'll talk about my business later, but the business I'm in kind of drew me to kayak fishing because, so, you know, I, I'm where I run the livery and stuff. I'm tied seven days a week nine hour days in the summer that's that's all i do i work 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 so that kills my summer jive fishing i can't get into it so i'm like if i'm gonna fish when i started i'm i've got to i've got to learn how to winter fish so you know i youtubed a few uh things and i found jeff little on there you know he was giving seminars, doing videos of wintertime pattern fishing. And I'm like, well, I was always brought up and my parents always told me, well, fish don't bite in the winter. They hibernate. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, no, not the case. You know, he, he shed a lot of light to me. And I started uh, 
fishing some in the winter off the bank and i'm like you know i've got i've got to change this and then kayaks come out on the scene and they got a little bit more advanced and i hopped on the train and uh to do the kayak so i really i really like it it's you can kind of do it yourself you know it's not like a big boat i think it's a good time then to bring it up like what do you do for work that really pushed you towards kayak fishing uh well i run where i run a new river outdoor adventures so it's a livery and i rent canoes kayaks inner tubes i sell fishing and hunting license i got a tackle shop i do uh bike rentals on the new river trail i do shuttle service i'm doing a whole lot of stuff with that so you know that and i love the fish so it kind of sucked a little bit i mean well it's my livelihood but i'm like i missed fishing I, I couldn't do it so i had to learn how to winter fish and and I started knocking a couple in the head and I'm like, you know, it's, this ain't too bad. And I got a little bit better at it, but I really love to do it now. And that's kind of really evolved me in kayak fishing as far as, uh, as far as that goes. So that's kind of the turning point for me to drive me in to kayak fishing is my work. How much busier has your shop gotten over the years? Cause I know like an example is like Smith mountain Lake has gotten insanely busy from like 10, 15, 20 years ago. Do you see that same like influx of, of traffic with your shop? I do, I do. Uh, so we're, I'm a, I'm a 15 year old working guy working down there. So I worked for another company for three years and that guy retired and I took him over. So when I started out, I had a, I think I had four kayaks, two canoes, and uh, four bicycles. And I started, and now I've got, you know, I, 20 canoes, 60 kayaks, and probably 60 bikes. And I, I, I empty everything I got a lot during the summer. So it, it's definitely grown a whole lot. People starting to enjoy outdoor recreation a whole lot more, you know. The guys come up out of my shop. I'm not one of the, I'm not somebody that's going to just blow somebody off about fishing to keep all my spots. I mean, I willingly share. I got a lot of young people come up there, you know, they come up there, catch a four pound smallmouth or something like that. And they're all smiles. And I really enjoy helping people do that. So, I mean, it, it's grown a lot in the past 15 years. How, Compared to like the Shenandoah River or the Upper James that are pretty, I would say safe for just a for a couple or a family to go out kayaking or canoeing. It, is it something that you really got to be watchful of when you have somebody come up and rent a kayak or canoe on the new river? Because it, it's a little bit more dangerous, correct? So I don't, I don't, I've spent a little bit of time on the Shenandoah and stuff. Uh, Seems like the Shenandoah would be a little bit narrower than the New River is super wide, especially where it flows through my part of Virginia. It's it's not as wide as the Susquehanna, but it it's pretty big. And uh, the average depth of my river is probably three to five foot, maybe. They they might be some seven foot areas in my river, but for the most part, it's pretty it's pretty laid back and it's family orientated most of the runs i do i do uh, uh, 58 bridge down to riverside boat landing riverside to old town and then freeze the town of freeze to my location uh, which is you know ends at the low water bridge so i do them three runs and they're they're all self-guided and they're really family friendly i think though i've got a class two rapid on one but for the most part it's it's easy stuff you know everybody has a good time the hobies had a kayak tournament last year on the new river and it was a really cool event because first off i'm glad that they go to experiment with different places were you impressed with how the river turned out or were you like damn it they went at the wrong time of year to really show this place off yeah, I, well, I mean, I want to say that. It seems like 
it seems like whenever we do attract and we get a good event here, we always miss it. Uh, we had a local tournament. Uh, I helped some guys put together a tournament to benefit autism. We had it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, about, I mean, three or four weeks ago, I got a six, eight out of the river. And I mean, I was just cracking, man. They was, they was piled up, staged up. Perfect, man. They was hot. And we had the tournament like two weeks after that. Well, most of the girls had already, you know, did their thing or commenced to doing her thing. So that made it, that made it tougher. Um, if you can time it just right up here, you know, especially I, I used to host a lot of tournaments myself, like in the spring, if you can time it just right. And a lot of these guys are like, Oh, the water's dirty. The water's high, man. You got, if you got the right mix in there and you hit it right, you can see some, uh, some big giant fish. So, I mean, tournaments like the Hobie and stuff, you know, it, it, it is what it is. They got to do it when they do it. You know, they got to work around all these other tournaments and stuff. So yeah, it, it's hard to get the, the perfect storm, I guess. What is the river capable of? Because I, I've had some fun conversations online with people that it seems like the new river, it, it doesn't have the, the volume of, and this is anecdotal, of course, but of three to five pounders like the Susquehanna has, but it can kick out seven, eight, almost nine pound fish. It's stupid. Like, be, be, why do you think that is? Uh, well, I mean, the river, I think's perfect, uh, habitat for fish, uh, especially in my section, you know, we've got lots of ledges, shoals. We got a, a great food source. We got, you know, crayfish, helgamites, uh, a lot of bait fish in the river. You know, our river, I think I want to say, let, let me think a minute. I want to say probably eight years ago, we suffered a catastrophic ice up here. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody talk about that, hmm. but it was catastrophic, man, because I think it was in February and it stayed like in the teens for like two months. So, and the wind blew. So the river, of course, the river froze, which is nothing new. I've seen it fr fr uh, freeze many times. It, it don't really matter, but it froze and it froze so hard and for so long. And then all of a sudden one day we had a, a rain brew up. So it, just not a sprinkle, like a four inches of rain brew up and it was a warm rain. So what it did, it, it rained and it raised that ice and it raised the river. So then the ice come up, the ice started breaking and sheeted. And, uh, man, I've got some video of it, but it was, it was something to see. It sounded like a train coming down the river. So all the trees, campers, anything on the side of the river, it took it. It's just like steamrolled it. So in turn, what that did to the fish that was in the river, it, them sheets of ice would go down like they were to go everywhere, down in the river, and they actually pushed a whole lot of fish out on the bank. I, I know so because like a couple of days after the event, I, I did some walking in some areas, and it was just – uh it was kind of heartbreaking to look at it. Some of the fish I actually seen the 23 land on the bank and it was, you know, it was crazy. And it was a big, it was a big number of big fish. So, you know, that's been seven, eight, nine years ago. And as of last year, we are just now starting to shine again, like we was before, before, before the ice, me and my wife could go out together and catch 150 fish in a day, easy, in an evening. And I'm not talking all of them will be giants. I mean, lots of small ones, but, you know, you'd get a couple of good ones. But uh, the river's starting to really show out now. Uh, it's, we've had probably four or five really good spawns, and uh, everything's been perfect. The survivors that made it through the ice are going to be your – dump trucks they're <laughs> your big they're your big fish so they is some of them out there uh but yeah we, we've got a we've got a great 
fishery, and I mean, it's just going to get better. It's I can't say enough good things about it. Do you think the new river has the potential to crack another eight or nine pounder in our lifetime? Absolutely, hundred um, percent. I've seen, I've seen some some stuff, and I don't want to say you know the people be like, oh, that was a carp, that was a carp. No, I mean, I've seen. I've seen some big fish in the river and I don't want to say eight, nine pounds, but I mean, who knows? I mean, I've, I've got a great place. I fish in the winter and, and it's just, it's just loaded with humongous fish. And, uh, I've seen some, I've seen some promising things. So we'll see, but, uh, hopefully hey, I get it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, dude. And we, I definitely want to talk about uh, the one that you caught too. Um, but just in general, since the New River is really unique because it's separated, I think, with Clater Lake, generally, are you fishing the section below Clater Lake Dam or are we talking about above Clater Lake Reservoir? I, I, I fish above. So okay. I don't fish below down in Pirate and uh, White Thorn and places like that, not to take no butter off her toast. I mean, it's New River Outdoor Company down there that guides and, and Brett Stoudemire and them put up some immaculate fish down there. They, they've got some giants, but, uh, you know, not, not it just don't get talked about enough up above up mm -hmm. above the dam and and i stay up here only because i need to stay close to my my work you know i've got kids i want to stay here and fish so i mean i just went out and i know the river pretty good up here so i i just did a whole lot of work up here and i think it gets overlooked a whole lot people come up here and they get pleasantly surprised yeah, uh, absolutely. Because I, I I knew very little about above the lake. I mean, I fished Clear Lake uh, with family vacations when I was a kid before, and I, and I know with with other guides I've had on talking about below the dam. Um, one thing is is does the water fluctuate the same? Because I know because of the dam, if you're below, it, it, it's a different type of animal that you're dealing with with the currents, with the water temperatures. Generally, you know, what is that like in the summertime above the lake? uh we've normally got we've normally pretty low in the summer just to be honest with you it's uh we've not got the amount of grass that they've got below the lake which is fantastic i love all the grass they got down there i've fished there a lot in the summer and did really well uh below the lake up uh, above it's it's different we've got a lot i like to call it uh snot grass i don't know it's kind of weird it's kind of lays on the top and it's you throw a crankbait out and you bring back a ball of grass that big and you just can't do it you i always throw a lot of top water in the summer that's all i throw because you can avoid the grass like yeah but uh we 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 usually get low she's low up there for where i'm at that's interesting so when you're dealing with those flow rates and that's why i asked earlier about the depth and everything because it sounds like below the dam you are going to have a little bit deeper a little bit faster running versus above it's kind of like you're more like a normal river kind of flow rate which is which is interesting um i i would love to get if you have the story you caught and this will probably be the thumbnail for this episode a, a gargantuan dump truck as you put it fish like holy crap were were you expecting to catch something like that that day or was that a happy surprise uh i was expecting to catch some decent fish but yeah that was totally was not that come from out of left field when i had that you know you back yep i'm back all so, right yeah that so, that that fish wasn't the 21 and a half and i've caught quite a few 22s i've got 123 but uh yeah i mean I always tell people whenever you hook a fish and you think it's uh, a catfish or a muskie and you get it up and it's a small mouth, it's usually a, it's usually a pretty good one. Expecting that fish at all. I, but I knew it was, I knew it was special when I seen it come up and flash and I knew uh, I had to get to the bank with it. So uh, I'm usually known for, I used to be a hundred percent finesse all the time with tubes and stuff. And I still do that. I went a hundred percent power. So 
in the past couple of years. So, and I really enjoy that. So, uh, crankbait, usually what I'm throwing, but yeah, I got that fish and I don't mind telling you, I got that fish on a big chatterbait. I think five, eight sounds. Has chatterbaits taken over for more of your fishing? Cause I'm, I love crankbaits and it's hard for me with small mouth, but a lot of people are throwing chatterbaits more for small mouth. And it, and it feels like when I fish smallmouth tournaments, I feel like less the field is throwing crankbaits, which is just strange to me. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 I don't know. They're easier, I guess. I don't know. You're not going to hang up as bad, I don't guess. Uh, you can cover a tremendous amount of water with them, you know. Uh, I mean, look at Drew Gregory. Ask Drew Gregory what his favorite bait is. He's a he's an animal, man. Hats off to him. I, I got to stay with him uh, at the Susquehanna this past October, and I learned so much from him. He's a great guy, but yeah, he's the chatterbait man. So, but chatters is, uh, definitely work good as far as smallmouth, and that actually the quality of the fish, you, the big ones like chatterbaits. Yeah, for sure. Where are you between the Ned rig and the tube? Because I talk to so many smallmouth river rats and I feel like it's a religion. It's either team tube or team Ned rig. It's never like a guy that likes both equally. Uh, man, I, I never did the Ned rig thing never did catch on with me. Uh, it caught on with greater America, but I mean, I threw it some, yeah, and they, they work great. Uh, when I first started, when I first started really cracking some fish up here, even in the winter time, I didn't, they, this is before Ned rigs come out. So there's a guy and I can't remember his name, but, at the shop he come up and he said dude he said you've got to be throwing these three inch stick worms he said they're insane and i mean this has been that's that's been 15 years ago i can't wow. remember his name nobody nobody threw anything like that up at the house they was all white grubs and uh stuff like that uh jerk baits and stuff nobody threw that now i took that out and I started throwing that. This you could go to Bass Pro if you even got a sticko, or you know, you could get the Yamamoto Cinco's. Uh, Yum Dinger was another good one, and it was just that. That was before the ice, and that that's what accommodated to some of them hundred plus fish days. Man, it was just crazy. But that Dude, was the white grub, the man. God, that's a blast from the past. I like, yeah, I, like I haven't thrown that since I was in high school because like the swim baits have kind of taken over for it pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an old school thing, man, up here. That's, that's all I used to have on before is that's, that was my go-to was a white grub. But then back in, you know, I didn't, I mean, I, I fished and I did pretty good at it, but I didn't know nothing of what I know now. Uh, I ain't through a white grub, but I don't know. 20 years I ain't through a white grub. But uh, what was your biggest aha moment to like growing on the river where things like you felt like clicked for you? Uh, probably my fishing game started escalating a little bit, probably when I started winter fishing and uh, I did a little bit of exploring on the river and, and I started, uh, this was before kayaks got crazy. Now you go out and they's like, I mean, if you go out in the summer, there's like 30 kayaks on a stretcher floating up here. But this was way before that, man. And we just had a field day. Uh, things started getting really, it was just easy. It was easy to pick, pick, pick. You know, we, we had fun doing it. But uh, I feel like I definitely growed in my fishing then. Yeah, it's interesting that we have those moments, especially whether it's like we're talking grass fishing, tidal fishing, smallmouth fishing, where it's like this, ah, this makes a little bit more sense. Um, for me, it was understanding just angling and how you approach an eddy, whether it's the summertime or whether it's the winter, that they are a little bit different. How much time you want to spend on a spot, like fishing the wintertime actually helped me understand that in the summertime, 
don't spend so freaking long in an area like move and I didn't appreciate that until it was the winter time and you had to sit in some of those big eddies for a ungodly amount of time to get a bite. I'm like, well, oh, crap. Why am I, why am I waiting the same amount of time in the summer that I'm in the winter? That's stupid. And, and that was my aha moment, honestly, in fishing is understanding their seasonal movements a little bit better. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a interesting thing, man. I, I really, I enjoy fishing. I enjoyed fishing. Don't get me wrong. I, I could do it every day. I love it, but, I really didn't start appreciating fish until I started understanding these different techniques and I started growing in a little bit of knowledge. I started talking to a lot of these big hammers. Uh, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to hang out with a whole lot of, of people, you know, you were talking yeah, was, about the people you got to hang out with. I will say, yeah, I was saying like people like, uh, you know, for instance, like Jameson Redden, uh, he just lives down the road from me in Rhonda and I met Jameson like probably 12 years ago. He started coming up here and I'm like, gosh, who's this hot shot coming up here at this big old truck with all these rods on top. Of it? I got to know him. You know, I wanted to get into it and I wanted to talk to him and I'm like, what you doing, man? Oh, I'm repping with for Jackson kayaks and all this. And, you know, but he was a really laid back, easy going guy. And, uh, these different people in the kayak industry and i've found out you've got so you've got the guys that keep a lot of conversation going don't care what they say and stuff and then you got the ogs you got people like and i consider jameson an og you got jeff little you got some of the old school guys what would be considered an old school guy just just guys that seasoned in it like the guys that first started when kayak just the guys from the get up and start the guys i looked up to when i first started fishing the guys i youtubed to find content and stuff of you know what was going on what type of kayak the guys, are you running? The guys that the the guys too the guys that handle their self well in a form like they're really soft spoken and full of knowledge yeah i appreciate that what Kayak and kayak are you running? Kayak, uh, I my favorite kayak, uh, I can't seem to let go of it is the SS 127 by Bonafide. So I'm a dealer for them and I'm also on the factory team. So I've been on the factory team. This is my second year on the factory team. I've got a RVR, I've got a 127, and I just have picked up the PWR. So I've got it on. I've got it on the table at the shop and I've not really started rigging it yet. I had some health issues come up that slowed me down for a couple of weeks and uh, I've not got around to uh, rigging it up yet, but kind of excited to get out on a PWR. Uh, it's getting a lot of good, good kickback and talk. I'm, I'm excited. I, cause I love the 127. I'm going to see if uh, it takes over that spot for me. How important is to actually get a kayak that's specific to a smallmouth river versus I don't know what's the most obvious one? Um, a PA 14, like versus somebody like going online and say, Oh, look at this big thing. I'm just gonna grab this. Like, is it important to get a kayak that really is matched to where you're fishing? Uh that's hard to that's hard to say, kind of, because at, more or less it needs to be matched to you. Uh, it's what you need to be comfortable in because I mean, no joke, you, you make a PA 14, uh, that's a huge kayak, man. That's what 140, probably 140 pounds. It's a big old kayak, but I have seen, you know, people like Christine Fisher. I did some, uh, shuttle for her, you know, some other people that, that do the Hobies come up here and they eat this river up, man. They're just knowledgeable on the kayak. They know what they're doing. Now, if you take, if you was to take some green guy that's wanting to get in the kayak and he ain't got no experience and he gets on our river with a with a pedal drive or something like that, he's probably going to toast it, man. Hmm. Probably. That's really interesting. I like how you said that. Like you got to match the kayak to you, and not the. Pl I like that a lot. That's interesting. So on my kayak, I for the past two years I've run a Torquedo. Uh, 
the, the little mid-grade travel motor that I don't really think was meant to sell to start with. It was just a promotional motor to kind of show it off. But that motor to me, and I've had people like Jeff Little and stuff, you know, talk them the big motor up and uh, tell me, you know, you need to check this out. It's so much stronger, tougher, lasts so much longer. And I'm sure it does. But this 403 is perfect for me in the river because it's so lightweight. And interesting. It's great. How, for people that aren't learned in these motors, what would you say like the average speed with that is in a boat context? Because I know I have a lot of boaters. Would that be like a 24 volt trolling motor, a 36 volt trolling motor, a 12 volt? Just so people understand like how much kick they got. One point, I think it's 1.5 megahertz so okay. whatever that divvies down to i know i'm a 200 pound guy i mean i'm pretty good sized and i mean you know the the 127 comes in at 94 pounds so i can run most of the time if i don't have a headwind and i'm going against the current i can i can roll on about 4.3 mile an hour something That's like pretty that good. if i'm coming down i sh i shoot it pretty hard yeah, it's uh, it does really well, and you know, like I say, the eleven oh three, I think you can you can top out over six mile an hour in it, but that's that would be your advantage on a lake. For the uh, river, for the river, I don't really think it matters, man. I, I'm tickled to death with four point three mile an hour. I could do that all day, you know. So, really, ain't important to me. I think the two. And I'd like to get your opinion on this. I think the two major, I think the two major historical. Oh, there he is. Okay, cool. All so, right. I didn't hear anything you said. That's yeah. why I stopped. No problem. I got a, uh, I got my notepad here just to keep notes on uh, what I'm editing. So I got no worries there. Um, yeah, you know, I want to get your opinion on this. In my belief, with with what I've covered in in kayaking, I think there's two big major historical milestones that changed kayaking. The first really was, and again, guys, this is just looking at it from a historical context, Hobie introducing a pedal drive and then Torquedo getting into the game. Those two things really change it from just like a, a hobby to like a legit, like this could be, it gave you mobility. Would you agree with that? 100%, man. Yeah. I, I would not have agreed to that before I kind of dipped into the sauce a little bit, but yeah, man, it's a, uh, I, Here's my big thing about a torpedo, man. I fish some conditions up here. I don't I don't wait till the sun's shining and it's beautiful outside to fish. You gotta fish them nasty days. <laughs> or I do. You know, for one, I ain't got a bunch of people wanting to rent boats. And for two, I think the nasties when you're gonna get them get them nasty fish. So I know I was talking to and I told him, I said, well, the weather was, I think it was 20 mile, mile per hour sustained winds with 25 mile per hour gust. And the river was rolling uh, 4,500 CFS. So, yeah, that's not, uh, that's not ideal conditions. I probably wouldn't recommend nobody to get out in conditions like that. If I wouldn't have had a motor on my kayak, I would look like an idiot. So, that's definitely... Uh, yeah game changer for sure once you have a a motor on, on your kayak what because i think growing up like whether it was a canoe or a kayak you always just floated you did a float trip once you had a motor is that still your preferred way of kayaking is floating downstream or once you have a motor are you more concerned with maybe going upstream or up current uh I'm I'm limited on my time, so I've got things I've got to do. You know, as far as my work goes, I'm I'm dedicated to picking my son up from school every day at two thirty. So if I roll out and uh, get him to school, I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, I've got six hours, so I gotta hit the hit the water maybe at nine o'clock. I fire the motor up. I know exactly where I want to go. I just I don't, that's, that's the advantage to me. So I can go, I want to go hit that rock pile. I'm going to go up and fish the water coming over the dam. I want to go over here and hit, hit, uh, 
hit the spillway. So that just lets me find where the fish are at. And then I, if, you know, if they're not there, or they're just not active. I'm zooming to find active fish. So that's the biggest necessity of the motor to me. It's not really going upstream, but it's just going different places in a timely manner because I'm always watching my watch. Yeah, that is interesting because I've always wondered now that I'm, you know, spoiler alert for, I think, yeah. So this will already have happened by the time this episode drops, but I do have a, I'm getting a torquito put on my boat by uh, Trey Leach of Innovative Sportsman's. And I'll finally have one. And to me, the interesting thing is with, with tournaments now on, on smaller rivers is, is it going to be better to use the motor to go downstream faster in between holes? Or is it better to go upstream because each cast will be in a more of a sufficient you know, strike zone because you're bringing it downstream? I heard, is it going to be better? That's the last thing I heard. So... I now got. I now I'm getting a torpedo put on by Trey Leach of Innovative Sportsman. Huge shout out to him for all of his help. And now I'm thinking, when I do smallmouth tournaments, is it better to float downstream, but now I can go faster in between the good spots, or is it better to go upstream because when I cast my bait, it's always coming correctly. I'm I'm coming downstream or at an angle. Why not do both? You you're going to be able to now. I mean, you can do so much with a motor, and you know just. Just to sum it up, having a motor, having a motor when you're fishing like that is 100 percent an advantage. You can you can do big fan of kicking my throttle a little bit and fishing while I'm going up, hands free, you know, stirring with my feet. Uh, you're just covering so much water, man. It's uh, it's definitely not. All right, man. This is painful. It keeps cutting off. <laughs> You got to just keep on getting on. Yeah, I hear you. So, you know, that is really interesting, actually. I never thought about that before. But, yeah, you can basically do both. So, with that said, what is the best time of year to come on down to the New River to actually check it out? I think the best time to come here and, and knock your PB out would probably be the spring. But don't come... uh to sip drinks on the river come to do work because it's probably going to be harsh. You're going to have a yeah. lot of, or you're going to have high water. You're going to have a wind. Uh, you know, that to me would be your PB time. Also, you know, all during the summer, you know, late evenings, early mornings is good for top. Then you got uh, jerk baits. Great and stuff in fall. Like for the fall feed up can be great too. So, You've got them three good times, and it really just depends on what you're looking for. That makes a lot of sense. That really does make a lot of sense. Um, Tim, how can people find you if they want to come on down, experience everything that you have to offer? Yeah, just uh, look look me up on Facebook, uh, New River Outdoor Adventures, uh, on Google. I got a pretty good presence on our new river outdoor adventures and, uh, just give me a call and come by and it'd be, I'd be happy to talk fishing with you or help you get on the water or whatever I can do. Sell you a kayak. It don't really matter. Just whatever. Awesome stuff. Guys, as always link in the episode description, of everything we talked about. Oh, and you were also in a magazine article. Um, which magazine was that? So we can make sure people. Go check be, that out. Yeah, I've got it here. So it'd be the kayak kayak fish and fun magazine. And that's published in, uh, uh, Florida. So Jeff, what Jeff come up here and, uh, Come up here last year and fished with me and brought uh, his camera crew and stuff. And we fished the uh, freezer. He's a really nice guy. He's a, also an editor for In Fisherman. So, uh, yeah, that, that magazine just dropped. If you see it out, it's kayak fishing fun. You can pick it up. And I've got a couple of pages in there kind of talking about my business. And he kind of interviewed me and asked me some questions kind of similar to this. But, uh, yeah, just trying to get eyes on the new river here. I think it deserves them. 
Tim, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about. Please go check him out. Really support him. He's And go fish with him, too. Get This man needs to get out on the water more often. He works way too hard. Uh, if you guys could, also, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.